Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of A View from the Ridge, uh, Spalding Ridge podcast featuring myself, Emil Fernandez, and Sarah Katz. And today I'm also pleased to welcome uh, a couple of other colleagues from Spalding Ridge, uh, Ms. Nikita Joy and Colin Pullums, who are joining us on a, uh, a, a unique version of this podcast on you know what's, what's a pretty somber time in our country right now as we uh, deal with a lot of unrest and a lot of justified unrest given what's been going on uh, these last uh, few weeks and obviously long before that. So uh, today we thought we'd have a, an open and honest uh, conversation about race, race in, in, in business, race in uh, the impact of uh, racism in our lives and what we can do about it and what we are trying to do about it. So, um, you know, we've got a few topics we want to talk about and then finish up with, you know, a call to action and, and how we are trying to, to make an impact and effect change and, and what you might be able to do as well. And I'll, I'll just be the first to, to say in a very, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, transparent way, I'm very uncomfortable with this topic. I'm, I feel nervous about talking about this. In many ways, I feel like the bad guy, uh, sort of the guilt by association. And uh, so, you know, we're, we, we've tried to include this panel of, of um, uh, this group of panelists to, to increase, include some diverse opinions and points of view. Um, so I guess with that, um, let's, let's kind of send it around the horn here. I guess, Nikita, maybe we can start with you and uh, you could talk about your perspectives and what's happening the last oh, yeah. few weeks. And, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, yeah. uh, but I thought it'd be good to get, get the conversation rolling. Oh man, this is really- uh, Hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, you said the last couple weeks? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Okay, cool. Well, um, I am Nikita, obviously. I, um, I think like the thing about the last couple of weeks is that for so many people, it's like weeks, years, months, years, your whole lifetime in the making. I was talking to a friend of mine that's very similar to the feeling that you feel earlier today. And sh she was asking me like, um, you're not black. Why does this feel so heavy for you? And uh, my answer was like, if you're holding something for five minutes, it might feel heavy. Uh, and you might think like, I'm holding the same way to someone else, but maybe that other person has been holding it for like two months or six months or their career. And then maybe there are people that have dealt with this since the moment they were born and have to carry this weight every single day. And so I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle because um, I am a person of color that deals with this stuff every day. Um, my partner is black, so he experienced it completely differently than I do to a whole different extent. And but it's something I've been passionate about for a long time. My background's in learning about how to talk about these specific items. That's what like my school is in. It's what I do outside of work. Um, but then this one feels a lot more closer to home for every single person because we're seeing it in the everywhere we look. We're seeing it like there's confusion at um, in our neighborhoods. There's confusion in our groups of friends if they're diverse. There's confusion all around or disagreeing opinions. And it's like, it's a hard topic, I think, for every single person because it's like so deeply personal, so deeply moral or immoral. It's so deeply like every single thing. Um, and it's just heavy and personal for so many people. Yeah, no. Um, and a uh, way to start it off, Nikita, sorry to put you on the spot, but obviously it's something that's that's a, a pretty, you know, uh, a deep topic for you and obviously uh, appreciate your perspective. I guess just to kind of keep like pass the baton here, Colin, do you want to, you know, talk a little bit about um, how you've, you know, experienced the events, obviously recent events, but also just, you know, long term, obviously something you've probably been dealing with for a long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am a, a black person, right? So this is a part of my identity from day one is understanding incidences that happen similarly to this. 
I would say, um, particularly recently, and I think this is really the culmination of just so many of these happening, right, is that you have just a global population that's at its boiling point where you recognize that, okay, it's not just once or twice or 10 or 100 or even a 1,000. This has been happening thousands and thousands and thousands of times over years and just the continuous damage that's done to, I wouldn't even say the Black psyche because it really is the, particularly the American, but then even on the global scale too. Um, you know, you're, you're really starting to feel at what point do we stop saying that uh, we know it's a problem, we see it's a problem, or we hear you, right? And when do we start saying, okay, now let's actually change this? And I think um, you're, you're really seeing across the board, a combination also with everyone being, you know, shut down in COVID and, you know, tensions being high because of that, just, you know, people are done. They're like, look, this needs to be the last time we're hearing about this, we're hearing about it too much. Um, at what point will, you know, someone literally being on the ground for nine minutes saying I cannot breathe be enough for the American people to all be outraged that there's a problem, right? Um, and actually, I think, Emil, you know, in kicking this off, your comment about how you feel you were kind of the bad guy or you were uncomfortable, I'm really interested to hear that from you. Because I think, you know, for a large population, I'd even say the majority of the country at this point, right? It's not you directly that's being impacted, but you still feel something. And you know how you're feeling, I don't want everyone to feel guilty about it. So would love to hear more from you and Sarah about how you guys are responding. I'm glad you said Sarah, because I'm gonna pitch it to Sarah. But uh, I, will, I will answer the question directly. I mean, look, I think there's, there's for, for a long time, it's been pretty easy to say, well, I'm not racist, you know, and that's that. But, um, you know, an article I just read recently and have been reading a lot of articles, I know Sarah's been reading a lot of stuff as well, um, draw the distinction between, between not being racist and being anti-racist. And so not being racist is a sort of a passive thing. Uh, being anti-racist is a more active thing. And it requires an action on your part, activity on your part, uh, because I think it, there's enough people of goodwill that they can turn away and just say, well, I'm not adding to the problem, but if you're not solving the problem, you are kind of adding to the problem. So exactly. I think just the distinction between one's passive, one act, one active. And I think one of the things that has really come um, to the forefront and just because of recent events um, is, is just being passive is no longer good enough. And, and frankly, it never was good enough, but I think people are realizing that. And Sarah, I want to give you an opportunity to get in here as well, although we just lost Sarah's video. All right. You still with us, Sarah? I think she's going to come on a different Sarah video now. here. Wouldn't be a Spalding Ridge podcast if we didn't have technical <laughs> here. Uh, You know, things die. You start over. So um, I, I think it's it it's just a really hard time right now on different factors for many people for different reasons and it it seems as though like i grew up in a family I, I i'm not from america i was born in belarus or uh ussr at the time and when i looked at and i was there's not a lot of diversity there and so when i moved and there's religion, you know, and there's a lot of different things that there was a lot of depression, I would say, like women, religion, diversity. And then when coming to the US to America, like to me, that's like everything, anything and everything should be happening here. And so I was always raised like thinking and believing that um, everyone should be equal. Everyone should have opportunities. And just the fact that we're not progressing and we're not making more changes and creating that, um, like this is just putting it to light. And I think to me, I just want to feel like, how do I become a better ally? How do I support this? How, how do we even get closer to that, you know, equality and opportunity? For people that might not have those opportunities today because of race or where they were born or 
you know, income within their culture or family. So. so I think it's always really interesting unpacking these in professional settings, right? So um, obviously inequality, racial diversity, issues like that permeate our society. And so when we're talking about them um, from just our day-to-day -day lives outside of work, the conversation is very different. Uh, but I think we're seeing more and more so now where that conversation has to become embedded in the work conversation as well, because, you know, you can't disconnect my experiences that I'm having in life from what my experience is going to be on the job, right? They're all, you know, a happy society helps create happy products, happy businesses, and even then a frustrated and upset society is going to lead to a frustrated and upset um, company that really isn't servicing your clients. So it, it all really does come full circle. Uh, when we're looking at it, I think from the professional perspective, Emil, to your point about, you know, feeling a little guilty, uh, I say thank you, first and foremost, I think um, for everyone, whether you are actually black, whether you are another person of color, whether you are white, I think all of us right now should feel some form of guilt. Because whether you are a part of the direct community or you're not, um, we have all, through some of our actions, allowed what's happening to continue, even at a small point, right? Um, we're all responsible for the society as we have it. So collectively, um, the guilt should be there. Uh, with that, though, I think, you know, and we had a few articles that we were reading and looking through um, in preparation for this discussion, but there's that whole concept of right now, how do you be an ally and how do you support and how do you be more active, right? Um, and that, that active piece is really key because if I'm just going and saying I stand by the, you know, the black community or I stand by the LGBT community or I stand by, you know, whatever community you choose and you put your post and your hashtag and your sticker on it, you know, at the end of the day, what good did you actually do, right? Versus an active ally where you're saying, here's a problem and I'm actually going to do something. And I think in that, that corporate professional setting, you know, it doesn't mean that we all have to leave our meetings and go storm the streets and start picking up, you know, signs and protesting right there during the day. Uh, it can be those, you know, those small things just of, hey, you know, I know that I do have a person of color on my team, right? Or a black person that I know is living in a city that's, you know, being impacted by this. Check in with them. Just, hey, how are you doing? Are you good? Right? They may not want to engage in that conversation because they may be going through a lot and that's totally fine. But a part of you showing that active allyship is, you know, again, reaching out, doing something just to show, I recognize this is a problem. I recognize it's a way for um, me to be a resource to you. And then uh, on top of doing that is that education piece for yourself, right? Um, you know, every single person of color, although there's, mixed messages on, you know, if people are responsible for educating non-people of color, if we're not. I personally have the mindset that if someone who is not of color has a question and they really are looking for, you know, areas to learn and grow and increase their knowledge of bias and diversity, I'm all for it. Like, let's have that conversation. Uh, a part of that, though, also has to be on the individual to go and do your own research, right? There's, there's the internet, there's a ton of things. So how are you actively taking steps, you know, as you say you're an ally, to really be that ally, not just in that hashtag, but in also your actions. I'm, I'm so disappointed. I thought hashtag activism was, well, that was it. You're saying there's so much more. <laughs> so, um, yeah, surprisingly. Um, so Nikita, I want to I wanna turn to you for a minute. And Actually, you know, Emil, I did have a follow-up for that. Welcome to podcasts, like interactive. <laughs> Is it a hashtag? It's a hashtag, you know, working together. Um, I guess, Colin, a question for that, because you did say, mention the hashtag. There was a little bit of a, a disagreement, actually, with uh, the hashtag um, Black Tuesday and then yep. hashtag Black Live, Lives Matter. And yeah. then there was just started becoming, yeah, so what's, what are your both thoughts on that? Because that, that just happened yesterday. I'll, I'll take I'll, it. Yeah, go ahead, Nikita. So the, it was actually the music industry that started Blackout Tuesday. And it was a black tile that a lot of people took to say, I'm going to mute myself and listen, which is a great sentiment. Mm -hmm. And there is a space for that, right, in fellowship. Um, using the hashtag Black Lives Matter is a way of silencing the people, and I'll explain why. That sounds really like 
intense, right? But it's there are protesters out there that are getting information by using that hashtag. hashtag. That hashtag is used for people that are educating each other and getting resources out. I have a lot of really close friends that have been out there in the streets and they're quickly getting to safety before things get wild or unsafe by passing information through that hashtag because you turn it on and the algorithm gives you information that's close by, places to go, information you need. When um, so many people who are trying their best to show support by putting this box out there and clogging up the hashtag do this, instead of actually making space and showing support, they're making it harder for the people that are on the ground actually trying to do this in a different way. Obviously, there's different arms of how to show support, but we don't need to step on each other's toes or get in the way. And a lot of people are saying, um, and I don't know, I mean, obviously a lot of this is opinion. A lot of people are saying that it was really intentional for them to start this trend um, because it is a way to like bury really good information that people are trying to use or get to. Um, and so that was kind of the, the controversy there. And I think a lot of people also are using it to all of the points you guys made to just do something that show it's like I, it's like a form of posturing or like yeah um, saying like hey i support you but i haven't called my senator i haven't donated i haven't walked out i haven't checked in with my friends of color i haven't done anything i haven't asked myself if i'm participating like if i'm being participants like showing bias i'm stumbling over my words here mm -hmm. um but like there's so many questions we can do before we get to that point, even if we don't do anything that other people see, right? Like, I'm Indian, not black. But I can say, and I, a lot of people get upset if we say like, oh, you're racist. But the thing is, we're all racist, every single one of us. Like, to Colin's point, every single one of us should feel and acknowledge that we benefit from a system based on oppression, right? Like. I know there's a lot of things that I've accessed to in this world at my jobs and my experience because I'm not black, even though I'm dark skinned and um, my family looks black, right? But like, I benefit from so many things that other people don't get. And because I'm benefiting and I am part of the problem and I am racist. So if I can before, say that- but <laughs> Really quick, Nikita, before you, because that point, I want to just wrap up the hashtag fact is what you were saying about the silencing and you know kind of being targeted and really distorting how the activists were getting information is so key. Um, Sarah, to the point I think I made about hashtags in general, hashtags are used really to establish yourself as a part of a community or to spread awareness, right? Um, as far as understanding that you know there's a problem with racial inequality in our country, no one should need a hashtag to be aware of that at this point, right? We are all glaringly aware. It's taught to you in school. We see it in our day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, that just using a hashtag, a hashtag to say, yes, I'm an ally. Like, really, are you an ally at that point? Because you're not contributing much in terms of, you know, furthering the, the conversation or improving lives. You're, you know, it's really a kind of self-gratuitous event, which not gonna knock for anyone because, you know, show solidarity, we need it. But we're also at that point where, you know, a passive action of showing solidarity versus actually doing something that will actually provide impact is no longer really sufficient. Yeah. So I, I wanted to come back. I was going to ask Nikita a question that was sort of a follow up to Colin's comments, which was about the intersection of, um, you know, this issue and the workplace and, you know, the company we all work for. And, you know, I think, first of all, you know, what we're doing as a company, but also what what more should should companies be doing to support their employees and and how does that you know again just because you come to work doesn't mean that you like check your ethnicity at the door right so it, it's it's with you 24 7 um you know i will i'm gonna give a shout out to one of our colleagues uh alex jackson who we were talking about this earlier um you know had put a post on linkedin i think it was the day after uh george floyd's murder and um you know it was raw it was really raw and i mean he put it out on linkedin which is a professional network and obviously there were some pretty pretty raw emotions in there and i can tell you that i i know that there's companies that you know that might get somebody in trouble or that might 
have some repercussions. I'm happy to, to, to say that, that we're not one of those companies, but I mean, that's also not a big thing. I'm not giving ourselves a pat on the back, but, but Nikita, I guess like what, what do you think, what do you, what do you think about the intersection of, of racism and employment and, and work and how do, how do you have to act either differently at work and, and, and what are things that an employer can do to, to be supportive? Well, that's like a whole other podcast in itself. Yeah, we don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know that I can go down that road because um, this is going to take three hours. hours or less, please. Yeah, please I don't know that we should do that. Uh, but but I, I want to go back to what you said before we keep going of what Alex posted. Um, I still haven't read it yet, and I'm proud of him for posting it and being vulnerable and all of those things. And I do think it's great that we work at a company where you can do that with no repercussions. But in the same breath, I want to say, if that's what we're patting on the back, the bar is on the floor, because like you should be able to say that stuff and it be okay. That should be the standard. And that's awesome that we can say that Spalding Ridge is doing that. But I also think that we should hold ourselves to that bar, if not higher, and hope that other companies are also living up to that bar, if not higher, right? That should be the goal. And I like, it's like a pat on the back with the understanding that the road is long and there's a long way to go. Yeah, just to be clear, I said it's not a pat on the back. I oh, oh. No, I mean, I kind of like, I mean, I, I, I feel like in a way it, it should like, I feel like I can say it is a, it is a thing because there are a lot of places that would ask people to be more professional. So I, I think it, it's two sides of a coin, right? Like it can be both. Well, and I mean, that comment to begin with, right, um, you posting your active response to a very glaring injustice is seen as unprofessional in places like that's a part of the issue, right? Yeah. Uh, so like the, the bar being that, yes, this is something that anyone should feel able to discuss because it is a glaring inequality in our society that is supposed to be based on justice, you know. Uh, I will say a pat on the back to Spalding Ridge to, you know, doing that minimum, right? That should be the minimum of any ethnically sound organization um, where you encourage people to find truth and understanding and not have to hide any of that. Um, especially, and yeah. I mean, for Alex, I think the forum of LinkedIn in particular is really interesting because when you do it on LinkedIn, it's not just, you know, your social network, it's also your, your professional network, right? And that message to your professional network that this is not okay, uh, but also the response hopefully being from more people in the professional network is that you also should be agreeing that this is not okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let's try to pick that bar up off the floor, at least a little bit, maybe a half an inch. I know one of the other things that we did recently was, um, and actually no, I'm sure, not sure if it was recently or, or when it happened, but the diversity and inclusion council that we formed to try to raise these issues and give them more attention at this company and, and hopefully create solutions. I, I'd be curious um, for Colin and Nikita, whoever wants to go first, what you would like to see come out of that? Like what, what sort of things do you think that that, that group should focus on and, and what should be the goals and, and the outcomes? This is Colin's baby. He should run with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's my baby. Well, like the values and the mission statement and all of that. So yeah. You got so, um, <laughs> you know, I think the premise of the DNI Council, and you see these in organizations, you know, really starting to get more frequently. Um, I was really happy to hear from Jay, our CEO, and Kara and Sarah and the leadership team when we first had the discussion about it of the team just recognizing that, hey, we know we come from areas of privilege and we know that we don't necessarily have these issues as our day-to-day -day issues, um, but we do understand that this is something that our organization needs to prioritize. And so informing the DNI group uh, was really, you know, one of my best moments being at Spalding Ridge of just a, a leadership team that really does not have to walk this, that said, yes, this is a problem that we're going to contribute to in any way that we can. So with taking that, you know, I look at it where we finally have solidified our beginning council. We've got our structure together. We're about to announce to the rest of the organization, you know, all of our purpose and details. Um, ultimately, though, the goal is to have a team of Spalding Ridge employees 
who we can help to advise and influence the organization on ways that diversity and inclusion should be impacting everyone's day-to-day -day work life, right? Um, when you talk about an inclusive organization or a diverse organization, it's not just about looking at people and seeing their different differences. It's about taking all of those different backgrounds or perspectives or ideas and ways of life and making sure that your business is stronger because of it. So we'll be doing things, you know, our hiring process, right? Uh, helping our hiring process to look at it from a DNI lens. Um, some of the events that we'll be doing, our company meeting, for instance, right, making sure that, you know, any activity that Spalding Ridge undertakes or any um, aspect of our organization is done from a diverse and inclusive lens. And this group really is there to just help advise and strengthen that mission. And I think that you guys have been talking through it, but the education and the resources and just mm -hmm. providing links or even what we were talking about, like re reading different books that we can discuss and openly and have mm -hmm. sort of like this, keeping it open and raw uh, without feeling like you have to put on filters. Uh, I think that's a progress and a journey that takes time to reduce the walls, right? Or like politically correct is the term yeah. that I always hear. Oh, yeah. And what I really appreciated on Monday was hearing from you and the rest of the team and everybody perspectives. I felt like it was, I appreciate you guys telling us, here's what's going on, here's how we feel. And I, I, I think if we continue being able to be open with each other and help one another so that people can understand a little bit more. Um, I mean, for me, it was really impactful. So thank you for doing that, both of you. But the to DNI Council is something that um, pro. I'm thinking about what you said, Sarah, about managing up. It was one of the first things I ever started bugging Jay, our CEO, just for anyone else that's listening that doesn't know that, um, about. We have an audience I, of thousands, by the way. Yeah, thousands. just so many people that can't <laughs> listen to this podcast, just in case. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about it. I actually forgot about it until I was looking up an old email to him where I'm like explaining why we need this. like. I know you don't know me. I know you haven't really met me, but I'm going to tell you why we need this. Please implement it. Um, and um, I think the safe, like Sarah said, the safe place is really important to be able to, first of all, be able to be candid with your leadership and each other about the reality of this, where the company is, where um, what we're experiencing, where we can grow. And then to Sarah's other point of education, I think, yes, every single one of us needs to be learning, but I think the benefit of having a diversity council in-house is to always push the rest of the company in the direction they need to be going on these topics. And like being like a checks and balances system for the company to like, hey, I'm not sure about this. I'm thinking of this initiative. How does this work, right? Let me, let us help the whole company get to a place where this, these values carry through to every aspect of the business. And you take the, the tactical piece of that, right? So if we, you know, excluding kind of the current times with what's happening, just as an organization, we said a while ago that we had some goals for our gender gap and also some goals for our racial and ethnic um, division where we wanted to have more racially, um, a more racially diverse workforce and we wanted to have more women in our workforce, right? Mm -hmm. So, but when you look at, you know, that's our goal, right? How do you action that? Uh, if you're looking at it, you know, without a DNI lens, it's just like, oh, we have this target, we have this target, how do I just go find these women? How do I go find these people of color, right? Versus from a DNI lens, you know, some of the perspectives we thought about were like, where are you sourcing from? Right. If you continue to source talent from the same pools that consistently give you the same backgrounds, then you're really going to cons consistently get that again and again. Um, you know, and helping to advise just small things like that. Well, maybe we should look at some other programs to do hiring from or engage your diverse talent in house to be involved in that hiring process. So prospects see that, you know, there's more than just our, our white colleagues that are, you know, front center day in, day out. Um, so a lot of different moving parts to it. I think, you know, I, I tend to look at it right now, especially as we're 
getting everything going as right now there's a hyper focus on DNI and on like very quickly helping to one just you know provide whatever support we can for the organization through this trauma. But the flip side of that is how do we create a really strong, diverse organization and a really strongly educated organization in these topics? And that's where, you know, all the small little nuanced pieces are definitely going to start to come to fruition. Well, I think one thing, Colin and Nikita, that we need to do is have another podcast in a few months and check back in to see uh, right. how we're doing with the accomplishments. So we're going to, I'm going to hold the bar very high um, and have very I like the accountability. The accountability. There we go. Uh, okay. So, so um, look, I think Nikita said it well. We could have we could talk for the next three hours, um, but this podcast is going to be limited to the size of my hard drive when we save this video. <laughs> uh, so I, I do want to start to wrap up a bit. Um, but you know, it wouldn't be you know having you know been running meetings for 25 years. It, it's in my nature to try to finish a meeting with a call to action and a next steps. Like what do what do we do from here? Um, so I'll go first, and then we can kind of send it around the horn. Um, you know, I think for me, you know, the, the lessons uh, certainly of, of this week and, and of this conversation is, has been that it's not enough to be, um, you know, sort of like passively on board, like hashtag activism isn't a thing. Um, and so, you know, being, being more active, being, first of all, starts with education. And I know we've got resources out there. Uh, in fact, you know, what we can do when we publish this, um, podcast, Sarah, we can put links to some of those uh, resources out there and attach them to the to this recording. Um, but, you know, having the education and resources, and then just making a commitment to being more active and vigilant uh, to be a true ally. Um, I think that's, that's my commitment. That's my pledge and something I think I can do. Um, I guess, Sarah, why, why don't you go next? Yeah, I, I, I think the I just need to get educated more. I, I, I don't think I appreciate or understand enough and I want to know more. And Nikita and I had a very a real conversation even yesterday of like how to maybe think about that and do that. And I want to put some time aside for that. And I also want to be able to um, help then support and be an ally, but also educate others. So, you know, be, continue that, right? Like what I've learned and what you know, and then be able to help others also understand more. And the last thing is, is I will make the full commitment that I will stand up, I will voice up, I will be with anything that I see that is inappropriate from any lens that's injustice or discrimination that I understand. Um, I will absolutely say something and do something. So that's my commitment. Colin, you want to go next? Uh, yeah. So mine, um, outside of just supporting as many as I can through this trauma, is actually starting to empower our organization. Um, and again, I, we know we talked about actually getting the word out there for the DNI Council, but actually working with the rest of the, the management team that are not necessarily black or people of color that are not necessarily used to this of um, ways that we as leaders can also be supporting our organization through this. Um, Sarah, you hit it right on the head where, you know, that first part of just being an active, you know, an active ally, right? It's not that you need to go out and do anything differently. It's just that if something does happen in front of you, if you do notice that there's an issue, not just hashtagging it, right? Or not just standing by, it's actually speaking up and saying, this is not okay. Right, or here's a way that I can help, um, and really encouraging the organization and coaching them through what that looks like. And Nikita, I gave you the first word, so you get the last word as well. <laughs> These are the ones that are um, okay. Um, this might take too many words, so I'm going to stumble over this a little bit. Be patient with me. Um, I feel like with this topic. I'm always at a really interesting intersection where I feel like in so many aspects of my life, a lot of people ask me questions and I get really like tired <laughs> of 
constantly explaining things to people. Like, I don't even know. Yesterday, I had like 37 text messages when I left work or left work, looked at my phone of people like trying to like talk to me about these issues. And I get really like, I'm tired. This is a lot. Um, so my call to action is going to be a little bit different. I think it's going to be choosing the people who legitimately want to learn and are enabling themselves and supporting those people and also making sure that there is space for the people doing the work to uh, heal and restore so that they have the stamina to keep going. So it's kind of like a I may not be here to support every single person through their entire journey from beginning to end, but the people that are out here with good, sort of like doing the work and trying their best to actually make a difference, I'm here for them. And I'll put my energy towards those people. Well, that is the last word. So Nikita, Colin, Sarah, thank you for this conversation and let's hope we can do it again. And this has been a view from the Ridge. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.